Okay, let's answer a few questions. We're starting a new series, and I've heard some of these questions. Uh, this one is, okay, why don't we just go find a new pastor? I mean, wh what are we doing all this interim stuff for, anyway? Great question. And I will tell you this, it is much easier to be able to find a new pastor if he's looking at a thriving church. Ooh, well, Jim, that's, are you saying that we are not thriving? Well, uh, there are many things about Northern Heights Church that are very positive. But it is also clear, we've done over 100 interviews and we've done some other things, that we could be so much more. And we want to become that so that when we engage in the process of finding our next pastor, he's able to see not a fixer-upper, not that you're a fixer-upper, but I'm just using that as an analogy, but instead see something that he's saying, I want to be a part of what God is doing there. Now, I've actually experienced that in some previous churches, and it's really fun. I'd love for us to be able to experience the same thing. So, what do we need to do to get better, Jim? Great question. The answer, it's actually going to take me uh, three or four months to answer that question, because we're going to work through some material that is going to speak to that. But come fall, when we finish the uh, survey that we're doing and the uh, health assessment and things like that, there are going to be some things that come out from that that are ways in which we want to address issues from the past, embrace God's plan for our future, and take it to the next level. And that's, that's coming. Well, Jim, uh, is there something we could do now to get ready? I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, I've asked that question. You know, God, what can we do now to get ready for what you want to do? And uh, my attempt to answer that question is actually, there are three sermon series that we're going to do. One is on the Upper Room Discourse, and that will start this morning. We'll do seven sermons on that. Then we're going to go to an Old Testament book that, and I can show you this from the scripture, that was actually written for you. It was written for me. That explains how to make good decisions. You know, when we are having to evaluate who is God's man to lead this church into its next uh, chapter, we're going to need to know how to make a good decision. So what does God's word have to say to us about that? And then the third thing, that, uh, third sermon that we'll do, this will probably happen in the fall, is I would like to help you to unwrap a package that is something that God has given you that I want you to see um, what that's capable of doing. But it, if, if we get a hold of this one, it will make this church an incredible, credible witness to the reality of the gospel in ways that are compelling and convincing. And so, anyway, those are the three things that we're going to work on. Okay, so what do I need to do to work on whatever you're going to teach us on these sermons, Jim? Uh, I would suggest that you, you know, get a journal or a notebook or, you know, whatever you like doing. You can take notes on your phone and ask this question. God, is there something that I need to do or be or embrace to better become the person you want me to be so that we can, as a church, thrive in our future. And just start engaging with him. I'll be talking, but this is really not about me. This is about you, and not just during the sermon, but during the week, saying, God, what do you want me to take from this? What, what are ways in which I need to learn something from you? Now, the first sermon series that I'm going to do, uh, or the first sermon series that I did when I came here, was really about just getting acquainted. You know, it was a chance for you to get to know me and for me to get to know you. Then we did a second sermon series on grace giving just to make sure that when we're worshiping, we recognize that worship is not just about singing songs. Uh, we worship through giving as well. But now it's time to start putting the truth into action to get ready for what's coming. Ready? Oh, thank you, one person, whoever said that. <laughs> uh, we'll see if we can bump that to three or four here in a while. So we're going to look at the Upper Room Discourse, which is John chapters 13 through 17. Now we're going to zero in on a passage in chapter 14, but 
The upper room discourse is this amazing speech, conversation that Jesus had with the disciples that occurred when he was in the last hours of ministry time with them. Now, this is fascinating to me for the fact that John actually wrote this in the late 80s AD, maybe early 90s. So he's actually recalling 40 or 50 years ago. And you know how there are certain things that you can recall from your past? I can recall a few things from my childhood. Some of them I'd like to forget. But anyway, you can recall certain things that just stick. And in John's case, you know, he's nearing the end. He's probably on the island of Patmos or experiencing the repercussions of naming Jesus. But he's going back to that night. This is hours before he is betrayed and then crucified. And he's recalling in vivid detail, with the Spirit's help, what Jesus said. And... Uh, Chapters 13 through 16 are kind of conversational instruction in which they're having, you know, the disciples might raise a question and then he speaks to that and then he says some other things. And then in chapter 17, he just prays and he prays for them. And by the way, he prays for you. The disciples didn't realize it at the time and maybe this hindsight factor for John is helping him, but they were totally unprepared for what was about to happen. They, they did not realize that Judas had left to go get the right people with him, really the wrong people with him, to, be, to basically turn over Jesus. But the dominoes were going to start to fall. So Jesus, in this meeting with the disciples, he says... From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass. Something's coming. And you need to know certain things if you're going to be ready for what's coming. He said a little later, this is John 13, 33, he says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. We're about done. What? What? I mean, I thought we were on an approach to an amazing establishment of your kingdom, etc. That's not happening? John 16, 28. I came forth from the Father. I, I came from the Father. And I've come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. And I realize that in that moment, they're not really processing this. John is able to recall 40 or 50 years later, and he's saying, he told us. But the process is about to start. He's going to be betrayed. He will be crucified. He will be resurrected. And a few weeks later, they will watch him ascend. And he's gone. Where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Ooh, that's good. Right now, you're going to be here. And this is not necessarily a good place to be. They killed me. They're not going to think highly of you to the extent that you identify with me. But you're going to stay here. Now, eventually, we'll be together. But for the time, there's going to be an interim of separation between us. And we, by the way, are currently dwelling in that interim of separation. Jesus saw this coming. I mean, he saw it before the beginning of creation. But he saw, you know, in less than 24 hours, how this was going to play out. And so he starts saying to them, here are things you need to know in light of what is coming that you're not, you don't know it's coming yet, but I'm telling you it is coming and here is what you need to know if you are going to thrive. Now get this, this to me is stunning. He actually prayed for us. We were on his mind. 
When he's talking about my children need to be ready for what's coming because I'm leaving and you're going to be here. He wasn't just talking about the 11. Jesus said, Judas left early in the evening. He was talking about us too. Listen to this. I do not ask. He was, this is chapter 17. He's praying for them. And he says, by the way, I'm praying for you. He was praying for you. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, the 11, but for those also who believe in me through their word. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know him as your Lord and Savior because you have understood the gospel that came from these 11. When Jesus was praying for the 11, I don't know if he, he saw the kind of the family tree thing or something. He says, oh yeah, here's Thomas. And he's going to end up, at least traditionally we're told, actually going to the, the west part of India. And these people, there are actually communities in India that trace their gospel lineage back to Thomas. I don't know who mine is. Uh, for one of my birthdays, my siblings did something uh, intriguing to me. They did one of these family heritage things. They actually traced my lineage. Did you know... Now, this is shocking. I, I'm not sure whether this is even true, but nonetheless, they showed me the documents of it. I am actually a great, 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 however many, uh, grandson of Charlemagne. You're not impressed. Okay. <laughs> what was it like for Jesus when he, he, he looks through this disciple and he sees and he's going to lead these 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 and your face is one of those faces that he sees. Jesus wasn't just praying and teaching and instructing those 11. He was praying for all those who would come to Christ through the gospel that they would preach. And he was providing information that is critical information for us to understand in the interim between his first advent and his second. He's basically saying, you guys have got to understand, and I'm using guys in a, a generic sense, you guys and gals have got to understand this. In this sermon, he outlines what we who believe in him need to keep in front of us in the interim before his return. He knows the ways we're going to be tested. And he's going to tell us, here are things that you can do, that you need to do in order to get to the right place. So we're not just going to read the upper room discourse and say, oh, isn't that nice what Jesus said to the eleven? What we're going to do is mine it for insight into what kind of faith do we need to have so that we can flourish and thrive in a season where it is hard to do so. Jesus has an interim plan for us. I mean, here are some things that are in this sermon, just to give you a, a sense of it, all right? He wants us to trust him. It's hard to trust him sometimes. When things are coming unglued or there are hard things that we're walking through, God, do you see what's happening? Do not let your heart be troubled nor let it be fearful. Now I've told you before it happens so that when it happens you may believe. I'm going to give you in this upper room discourse information about what you're going to be dealing with so that you can trust me. I'm going to tell you before it even happens, here's what you're going to be dealing with so that you can say, oh yeah, Jesus told me about this. I can trust him. He's got this. He also is telling us this so that we can celebrate. I mean, frankly, the world that we live in is broken. So why would we celebrate? These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. I'm going to tell you things that allow you to be able to say, yes, the world is broken, but Jesus is coming, and right now I get to tell the world about it and I am full of joy. Why do we sing? We just sang. Why do we do that? Because we know something. We know things that some of them, actually in the songs that we sang, come from what is taught in John 13 through 17. Jesus says 
in this sermon. I'm going to give you information that gives you reason to celebrate and be filled with joy when you are living in a world that produces the opposite. One of the reasons why he tells us these things in the Sermon on the Mount is he wants us to stay steady, to stay on track with him. Listen to this. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. Content that's in the upper room discourse is actually anti-stumbling content. Now, he says, I've spoken these things to you so that, and that's, so that is a, a thing that sets up a, it's a participle or a uh, clause modifier that tells us this is a result clause. I am telling you these things so that, here's the purpose, you may be kept from stumbling. Uh, stumbling is the word scandalazzo, scandalizzo, and uh, this word, uh, our word scandal, comes from this Greek word. It's the same word found in the parable of the soils. Listen to this. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. There's that word. This, the upper room discourse is designed to provide, and Jesus is saying so, these things I am speaking to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. You're not going to fall off track. Well, I'd like to think that you would say, hmm, this sounds like the information that's worth paying attention to. Jesus said what he did in the upper room discourse so that all who dwell in the interim, in which we now dwell, will not get tripped up. His words are not just good for an interim between pastors, but the interim between advents, the time between his first coming and his second. And so we can use the instruction that is in the upper room discourse to develop a faith that flourishes in a season, in a world that has gone off the rails. And uh, I like liken this to core exercises. You know, uh, I, because I had a heart attack in 2018, and it was a pretty serious heart attack. They did put a stint in, I'm okay. But uh, there was a significant damage done to my heart. So it was not functioning. You know, there are a lot of, I guess, dead cells or something in it. But anyway, the, the amount of blood that it was pumping up, out with each compression was not near what it's supposed to be. So I had to do a whole bunch of cardio exercises. I still do. And I'm happy to report when I went to Memphis, they ran a whole bunch of tests, and I'm actually normal now. This is awesome, because I was not normal before. Yeah, yay, I'm glad to be normal. So for those of you in the medical field, my ejection fraction was 35, and now it's in the 60s, so that's good. How did that happen? Exercises. You know, I still, I go, go to the Y, and I do interval training that's exhausting, but it apparently does some good. <laughs> the upper room discourse can help us with the same. We are going to be able to identify seven core exercises that we can do that are get a, going to get us to a place of a thriving faith that is essential if we're going to move to a, a, the next level as a church. So we're going to look at this morning what I'm calling one heart. And each of the principles will have this one. One heart, one way, one truth, one life, one mission, one peace, and one hope. You may be saying, well, I don't know what that means yet. Good, stay tuned, and we're going to walk our way through it. But this morning, we will consider one heart, which is about doing what we do solely for the fact that we love the Lord. We're madly in love with him, and that's what animates and motivates everything we do. Now, um, the one that we are going to look at today, one heart, actually shows up in the Olivet Discourse 12 different times. He talks about loving him. 23 verses. So, because Jesus talks about that, then some other things, and he comes back to it, then he comes back to it, and that happens with all of these seven themes that show up in the Olivet Discourse. So, I know some of you would like to take it a little deeper, so I've uh, prepared something for you. So, here's a, a set of sheets, 
And in this sheet uh, is the text of the Upper Room Discourse. So I've actually written down, sorry for the rustling noises, but uh, anyway, so here's a page. So here you can see, and there's a bunch of pages here. So this is the Upper Room Discourse, every verse, verse by verse. And you see where it's highlighted with color code. So what that's telling you is, for example, the one heart one is yellow. Yeah, you see some yellows in there? That's where that theme shows up. And I've, and I've highlighted all the passages where do what you do because you love the Lord shows up. Those are all highlighted in yellow. And then the other themes are highlighted in other colors. And so I've made some copies of this, which are here on the table in front of me. And so after the sermon, if you are going, okay, I want, I'm going to understand this because frankly what happens on Sunday morning is just a little small piece of it what really needs to happen is you engaging with the Lord going to the upper room and listening to him and this will help you do that so if you want a copy of this there are some copies here on the table in front of me I didn't know how many to make because I didn't know uh, what kind of response we get and in, in the uh, I'm glad I broke it into two groups because the first service they took them all and then they uh, wrote down here on the list, those who didn't get one, they put their name. So there are some up here. Come get one after the service if you want. But if you, uh, they're all gone, then just write your name and I'll make sure that you get a copy of it so that you can participate well in this series that we're doing, working through the Upper Room Discourse. Seem, seem clear what we're doing? All right. John 14, verses 21 through 25. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, uh, Judas the betrayer had left already. Lord, what then has happened that you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, but the word which you hear is not mine. But the Father's who sent me, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. Now, I could talk for several hours on this passage. We're not going to do that. Uh, but I'm going to identify some key things to you, and then... You can start getting before the Lord and asking him to teach you from this. It says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, and has and keep, those are both present uh, indicatives. In other words, the one who is having, is holding on to, has collected and is keeping, is treasuring my commandments, and who is keeping, and keeping is, is in the process of, he's, he's not just kept one, he, that's kind of his pattern. That's what he's describing. He who has my commandments and is keeping them, that is the one who loves me. And by the way, the way it's structured in the original language, he's basically saying, that is the one who loves me. The one who's keeping my commandments, who's holding on to them, and is putting them into action, that is the one who loves me. You can't keep what you don't have. Do you know what the commands of Jesus are? Now, we actually talked about one in a previous sermon. He says, go make disciples. That's an imperative. The one who has collected, who recognizes my commands and is keeping them, that is the one who loves me. He says, you know, that is the one who loves me. These are the defining characteristics of someone who loves me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And that, that's a future. It's basically saying, if someone loves, this is what happens. Basically what it means is, they want to do what I want done. What Jesus is interested in, that's what they're interested in. So here's our first core principle. One heart means love of Jesus 
propels obedience. Love of Jesus is what propels obedience. You know, he who has and keeps, that is the one who loves me. Implication, when you love him, that is what fuels following him. It comes first from loving him. Obedience, when it's the product of human effort, is unimpressive, often lame. Doing the right thing to be well thought, thought of or to avoid getting in trouble uh, is do the minimum obedience. But obedience, when it is driven by love for Jesus, is like a rocket that takes off. It, it soars to the heights. You know, if I had a, a rocket here, and I've actually done some demos, science demos for people before. Here's a rocket, and how high can you throw it? Well, most, uh, most of us, we might be able to get to the ceiling, depending on the nature of it. But that's not how it gets to the heights. You know, I have some rockets that will go up a quarter or a half mile, and all you do is you ignite it. And then what happens? It takes off. That's what Jesus is describing. We're throwing rockets <laughs> when instead what he's longing for is a people who have love for him. We are madly in love with Jesus and that is the propellant that is driving what we're doing. And it will take you somewhere unbelievable. He says, the one who has my commandments and keeps them, that is the one who loves me, and my Father will love him, and I will love him, and disclose myself to him. Did you get that? If we're loving him, and that is producing this changed life, then what he says is, and I in turn, that's what I love. I'm going, I love it. And he says, I'll disclose myself to him. I'll let you know what pleases me, what honors me. Did you catch the negative? He who does not love me does not keep my words. And if someone doesn't care about what Jesus says is right or good, despite that person's claims, according to Jesus, that person doesn't love him. The person who does not want to do what pleases Jesus, despite what they say, they don't love him. Non-keepers are non-lovers. Basically, there's only two groups here. There are love-propelled keepers, and there are non-keepers who don't love. Everybody in this room falls in one of those two categories. Now, by the way, if you're a non-keeper who doesn't love, we can fix that. I'll talk about that as we get toward the end of the sermon. Bottom line, loving Jesus makes all the difference. If we are going to be a people who thrive and flourish in what God's got for us, what we do must be fueled by love for Jesus. That's what, make, that's what gets us going. Love-propelled obedience will keep you from falling away in a world in which we now live, where it is increasingly costly to name the name of Jesus. The church in Ephesus had a, an amazing track record. You know, this was a church that, you know, Paul came to them, and uh, they followed Jesus with passion. Uh, they were doing great. But 40 years after that initial season, here's what Jesus actually said to them. He spoke directly to that church. And here's what he said. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. What does that mean? You were loving me, but now not so much. 
Love can fade. Love for the Lord can fade. And he says, I have this against you. This is not good. You've got a lot of good things, church in Ephesus, but you don't love me like you used to. It's cooled. Yes, we ought to love the Lord with abandon, but it's not automatic. This is what we're learning from Ephesus. In other words, it's something that he's saying, I have this against you, fix this. Recapture that original love for me. How do you do that? Glad you asked. What I want to share with you is, there's more, but I'm going to share with you three exercises that you can do. It's kind of like doing cardio exercises. These are three exercises you can do that will help you to grow your love for the Lord. All right? So let me share them with you. First one is take the measure of his love. Figure out how to map his love for you. And that will actually improve and increase your love for him. Now listen to this verse. Greater love has no one... This is uh, John 15, 13. It's in, the, it's in the Upper Room Discourse. Greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. Take a look at what I did for you. All of us are prodigal sons. We're losers. And Jesus said, yep, Jim, you're a loser. But I love you enough to take your place and receive the penalty that you deserve. That's why John says, greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. So if you will, map the ways in which Jesus loves you that will help fuel your love for him. When you see the incredible that is his love for us, that will help grow your love. Jesus can't do certain things. There's actually three things, I'll tell you one, that he cannot do. I realize that that might be a bit striking to you, but here, here's one of the things that he could not do. Jesus could not love you more than he already does. He loves you enough to die on the cross for you. So if we will take time to measure his love for us, then we will do what 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Now there are some places you can go in scripture that will be good. I highly recommend Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. Just use that as a way to look closely and take the measure of his love for you. Uh, you can do this this week. You can basically say, I want to, you know, and reading uh, Ephesians 1, 2, 3, there's other things that I can recommend, will help you be able to see he loves me enough to X, Y, Z. And that will help to grow your love for him. When we partake of communion, which we will do a little later, we're actually expressing our love to him for his love for us. He says, I will give my body for you. I will let my blood be poured out for you. That's how much I love you. Exercise number two. You know, the first one is measure his love. Try and find ways to be able to map all the ways that his love is expressed to you. Here's measure your sin. This one sounds kind of, uh, I don't know if I want to do this one. Listen to this account. This is Luke 7, 47. It's like the plane, so it's an easy one to remember the reference. Uh, 7, 47. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Here is a woman who was very clearly not a good woman. But Jesus had forgiven her. And she recognized that. And she was in love with her Savior. 
It's interesting that Jesus says, he who is forgiven little loves little. Uh, there's almost an irony in that because he was saying this to the religious leaders who are the worst of sinners for their pride. You know, they are hypocrites. Uh, they don't realize what a mess they are, which means that what Jesus is saying in here is it's not who's high on the sinner list and they can love the Lord a lot. It's those who are high on the recognize it list. I see my life for what it is. I see my sin for what it is. And so one of the things that uh, you could do, now that this, I'm not saying this is how you have to do it, but it will illustrate how it can be done, would be take a piece of paper and write out your sins. For some, you would say, well, that's going to take more than a piece of paper. And I get that. Although I'm not asking you to make a diary, you know, on May 16 of 1973, I did this. On May 17, I did this. What are the things that you would say, these are areas in my life that are dishonoring to the Lord? And make a list of them. Put, them on, put it on a piece of paper. Don't leave anything out. There's something that you wouldn't want anybody to know. Jesus knows, so it isn't going to be a surprise to him. Put it on the piece of paper. And then take it out in the backyard or somewhere and do this. Uh, bring a lighter with you or some matches and just say, Jesus, this is who I am. But you have forgiven me this. And burn it. When you do that, and you can find other ways to do that if you want to, when you do that, basically what you're doing is you're saying, I know what, it, what he died on the cross for. I've taken the measure of my sin, and I love him for what he's done. He was forgiven little. None of us in this room are forgiven little. He is forgiven little, loves little, but he who is forgiven much, that's all of us in this room, if we're honest, loves much. So the second exercise is one in which you take the measure of your sin and get before the Lord and acknowledge what he has forgiven you and that will help you to love with passion with fire. Here's the third one. He says, and this is in 1 John, about the same time as he wrote the Gospel of John, and this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. You, you want to know what love looks like? It's where you want to do what Jesus wants, and you're happy about it. You take joy in that. This is great that I get to do this because I get to do something that Jesus likes, that Jesus would approve of. So this third exercise is to find things that you would say, I am confident based on his word, this is something that Jesus wants me to do, and I am going to do it with joy. That's what people who love God do. They do what pleases the Lord, and they're excited to do it. They're not like kids who've been sent out to do chores and they're doing the minimum and with a bad attitude and they're kind of... <laughs> Instead, we're doing what I love to do with my wife. When I know there's something that she desires or wants or that would please her, I love doing that. So find ways to do what Jesus wants and to do so with joy because that's what love does. Anyway, those are three exercises that you can work on that will help you grow in one heart to do what you do because you love the Lord. A while back, I shared this passage with you. I think the Macedonians actually got this third principle, obey as a benefit, not as a burden. Here's the passage. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, 
begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Here's a people who are, you would look at their circumstances and say, how can they possibly do something that is pleasing to the Lord? But instead, because they loved the Lord, they found joy in doing what was even sacrificial, doing things that we would say, how is that even possible? But they loved it because love fuels obedience that is amazing. Though you have not seen him, you love him. A reference to Jesus. I've never seen Jesus. I've seen the evidence of Jesus. But I've not looked in his face yet. That's coming. It's going to happen. Though you have not seen him, you love him. I do. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. I do. How realistic is it to love someone you've never seen? Well, I've seen enough to know a lot about him, but I've never looked in his face. My closest experience I can think of is when Rochelle and I were dating uh, many uh, years ago. So this would be in the early 70s. Uh, she lived in New York. That's where her job was. And I lived in Seattle. And uh, this was back, some of you will understand this, this was back when there were no cell phones, there was a landline, and you paid for a long distance. And so we would talk on the phone. One month, and this is in the 70s, which I look back at this now and I'm in shock, our uh, long distance phone bill was $400. <laughs> That's how much we loved each other. <laughs> We decided, you know, this is ridiculous. We need to get married. And we did. <laughs> right now, we're, we're talking long distance. That's prayer. We might be exchanging letters. We can read his word and we can write in a journal or whatever, whatever we would say to him. But we haven't seen him face to face. But that moment is coming. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready and in that moment we will stand before him and we will see the one whom we have loved and whose love has fueled everything that we have done for that moment. That is the future of all those who love Jesus. Can't wait. The longing of my heart is for us to be a people whose everything, word, deed, action, is driven by all in, all out love for Jesus. And if that's the case, stand back because we're going to see God do something amazing. Let's pray. Father, we are in awe of how you love us. At the same time, we're, we're cognizant of the fact that we could do better in our love for you. Father, I am praying that you will teach us as your people how to love you and to love your son better and to arrive at a place where it's, it's gone to another level. Help us become a people who everything we do is fueled by an unbridled love for you in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.